Kol amal adam. No matter how much toil and effort a person exerts, he would not even be able to repay God for one breath that God has granted us. So this week the Torah discusses in great detail all of the garments, the vestments, all of the utensils that the Kohen Gadol himself was to wear. Okay? The Kohen Gadol had eight garments. He had the four regular garments just as all the other Kohanim plus another four. Now, the arguably the most interesting of the garments that Kohen Gadol wore was actually the breastplate. Right? We could all agree with it. The breastplate was, in Hebrew, it's called the Hoshen. It was a beautiful, beautiful piece. If you could imagine a golden plate with 12 beautiful stones on it, each one in its own special and unique color, all attributing and referring to each of the different tribes. Now this Choshen, this breastplate, was so special that it was the way that throughout the temple, both temples, it was the way that God communicated to the Jewish people. Now there's differences of opinion how it actually happened. Most are of the opinion that whenever the prophet or the king had a question and they needed God to answer the question, the answer would come through the breastplate, the stones actually lighting up. It was very, very unique. I guess you had to learn how to read what those messages meant and didn't mean. But it was a very, very interesting <coughs> item that I'm sure if we all had the opportunity to see it in real life would be fascinating to just see it, never mind seeing it in action. So this was something specific the Kohen Gadol would, would wear. It, as I said, took and had 12 um, stones, special stones. It was three rows of four. So you would have, for example, one, two, three, and then four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So it was three by four. Four rows of three, four rows of three, three columns of four, however you want to, however you want to call it. That's the, that's the correct, uh, that's the way, that's the way it was. Now, the Talmud quotes a verse in Yeshayahu, in Isaiah 54, 12. And the verse says as follows, I will make your boundaries of fine stones. In Hebrew it says, Vesamti kadkod shimshotaich usharecha. The verse in Ishayahu is telling us that God will make our boundaries, our frames, out of stone. Now, to this, the Talmud goes on to explain that there was a difference of opinion what the stones of the exterior wall of Jerusalem should be made of. One opinion was, it should be made out of the Shoham stone. And we'll explain a little bit about that. The other opinion said, no, it should be made out of the Yashfe stone. So it's either some have said it was the Shoham stone, and others said, no, when we build it, we should build it with the Yashfe stone. So you know what God came and did? God came and gave a revelation right during the construction of the Bet HaMikdash, the temple in Jerusalem, after the Jewish people entered the land of Israel, build it with both. Do a combination, a combination of the Shoam stone and the Yashve stone. That's what the Talmud in Masechet Baba Batra tells us. To that, the Zer Shon asks, what's so special about these two stones? What is it that is so special about the Shoam stone, the Yashve stone, what's the meaning behind these choices of stones, and what is it that one said one way, and the other said another way, and then God came and said, let's put them both together. So he comes and he analyzes, he says, if you look at the breastplate, the Hoshen of the Kohen Gadol, if you scroll down to the bottom row, yes, to the bottom row, if you look at the last two, 
you're gonna have the Shoem stone, is the second to last one, and the last one is the Yashve stone. Corresponding to properly would be Yosef and Binyamin. Yosef being the second to youngest tribe, and the youngest tribe, Binyamin. So he says, let's analyze something very special. He brings down the Shilte Giborim, which says in a very deep way, it's definitely in a spiritual, maybe in a Kabbalistic way, maybe nowadays we might even be able to prove it scientifically, but each stone, to those of us who know, have certain powers. They have certain things that they're able to give off sometimes in a positive way, sometimes in a detrimental way to a human being. Similar to herbs, just by smelling herbs, perfume, uh, incenses, um, how do we say, essential oils. Stones also, being around a stone or wearing a certain stone also has an influence on a human being. Now, what's the influence for a Shoham stone? So the Zerashim Shon quotes from the Shilte Giborim that there's four things, four benefits that one is granted by wearing a Shoham stone. Listen to this, this is fascinating. I'm thinking afterwards, we're all gonna probably go out and buy a Shoham stone. Look how amazing this is. Number one, it promotes good memory. It gets better. The promotes good memory. Number two, it promotes good eyesight. Sold. I'll take two. Three, I think if you haven't bought in by now, you're going to buy in by now. Wealth. And four, I think it's saved best for last, wisdom. Can you imagine, just by wearing, just by wearing this Shoham stone, you going to be blessed. It is something which comes in that a person is blessed with. Let's repeat it. Memory, eyesight. Okay, let's, let's, uh, we're going to explain everything. We're going to explain everything. Give me, have a little patience. I know we're very excited about what a Shoham stone is. We're going to get a Shoham stone. Don't worry. Okay. Again, memory, eyesight, wealth, and wisdom, all by wearing a Shoham stone. Now, what fits so ironically perfect, obviously not by chance, is these were all four things that Joseph himself was blessed with. And the Zer Shimshon proves paragraph by paragraph, pasuk by pasuk, each and every verse. Look at this. Where do we see that Joseph was blessed with memory? I'm in Genesis 42, 9. It says as follows. Vaizkor Yosef, Zechira, memory. Eta halamot asher halam lahem, vayomer alehem. So Joseph, he remembers the dreams many years later that he dreamt about his brothers. Now we're later on, Joseph is viceroy, his brothers come to him. He says, you know, before I let them go, let me. I remember now what I dreamt about, what I prophesied years before, and now it's happening again. Vaizkor Yosef et halomot. So Joseph was blessed with memory. That's the, that's the stone he represents. He was blessed with great eyesight. How do we know? Genesis 49, 22. Ben porat Yosef, ben porat ale ain. A Joseph was a charming son. He was a charming son to the eye. Joseph was also blessed with eyesight. We see the, co the comparison with eyesight, good eyesight, and Joseph, again, referring to the Shoham stone that he represents. Number three, wealth. Where do we see that Joseph was wealthy? Genesis 39.2. Vayhi Adonai Yosef, vayhi ish matzliach. Successful, successful in wealth. Again, wealth is not in the number, wealth is in the happiness. Hasamech if you're happy with what you have. He was the man. He was the leader. He was the CEO of Potiphar's house. So he was blessed. Number four, where do we see that Joseph was blessed with wisdom? Genesis 41:39. Vayomer paro el Yosef when 
Paro takes Joseph out of the jail. He takes him out of the jail and he asks him to interpret his dream. He interprets his dream. What is Paro? And by the way, make no mistake, Paro was a genius himself. The genius, the leader of the greatest and strongest country in the world says, Vayomer Paro el Yosef, Ahare odia Elohim et lechad kol zot, after God himself has told all of this to you. Remember, Joseph himself attributed his interpretation of the dream to God. So Paro says, wow, God has really given this all to you. En navon vechacham kamocha. There is no man which is as discerning as, and as wise as you. So Joseph himself, the tzaddik, the biblical character, whose stone that represents him is the Shoham stone, is the very same stone that blesses a person who wears it with all four of the things that Joseph himself was blessed with. And to repeat, that is memory, eyesight, wealth, and wisdom. The Zer Shemshon goes so far to say that the wisdom one can attain through the Shoham stone is almost approaching the levels of prophecy itself. That's fascinating. Okay, so instead of searching on your phones and Google what the Shoham Stone is, wait till the end of the class. I'm going to explain and tell you what a Shoham Stone is. Okay, that is the Shoham Stone. That's the opinion that said, let's use the Shoham Stone on the temple's exterior walls in Jerusalem, the gates, the walls, the, the fortifying walls. Okay, now let's go and take a look at what the prophecy would be according to this. If we look at Yeshayahu chapter 11 verse 9, it says as follows, that one day there will be no injury or destruction in, on, the, on the mountain of God. That's obviously in the future when there will be full peace in the Mashiach. It says, Ki ha'aretz de'a. The land will be full, filled with knowledge because they will know God. Filled with knowledge, how so? Again, alluding to, there are those that explain alluding to that when the temple will be built with the fortifying walls of the Shoham stone, which alludes to the wisdom and the knowledge and the memory and the eyesight and even the wealth, that will be that final day of when the temple will be standing in its eternal strength. Okay, now let's go on to the second option of the stone. And that was a Yashve stone. The Yashve stone was the stone which Benjamin represented. Binyamin, the youngest of all the tribes. What's so special about the Yashve stone? So the Yashve stone was a segula, a good luck charm to wear, in order to not be given or to consume any drugs or medicine which are detrimental to the human being. Now, it could be taking medicine by mistake, it could be taking any type of medicine or drugs on purpose. In order to avoid and to help someone from being tricked into or mistakenly taking some substance which would be, would be detrimental to their health, wearing a yashve stone would help a person. Very nice. What does it have to do with anything? What does it have to do with Binyamin? Listen to the connection. Binyamin was given birth to by Rachel at Rachel's last moments. It was very sad. He never knew his mother. Now, he could have continued living his life feeling that maybe I'm not well. Maybe I'm also sick. Maybe something is lacking for myself. So what was conveyed to Binyamin? No, Binyamin, look at how unfortunate the situation was, but how blessed the situation was on the other hand. That when your mother gave birth to you and passed, normally, and it would have been very normal for you to pass with her, Unfortunately, it happens more often than not. Now, Baruch Hashem, not so often. But very often, if a woman is in labor and she is giving birth and she passes away, 
more often than not, the child could also not survive. So what happened was, was the message being conveyed to ben Benjamin was that your mother, she herself was taken as if you want to call it a korban, a sacrifice, but she herself was gone and passed, but you are in your full strength, in your full health, alluding to that nothing bad in a health method, in a health realm, ever happened bad to Binyamin, because he again was attributed to that Yashfe stone. Very interesting. There's more. The Midrash says that if we look at which of the tribe's proper sections of the divisions of the land of Israel, the, te the temple actually was built in, it was built in none other than Binyamin's portion. Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, is in Binyamin's portion. The truth is, there is a small little strip explained, if you look at the diagram, that actually, our, our, our Chachamim tell us, that actually is from Yosef. It's from Menashe, I believe, that goes into, infringes in Binyamin's property, in his, in his division, and that's where the Kodesh HaKodashim was. So it was the two children of Rachel, who shared the very plot that the temple stood on, the majority of it being on Binyamin's, and a little part, the Kodesh HaKodeshim, was actually where Yo it was part of Yosef's very own division. What does that mean? Binyamin, how did he get this merit that the temple should be in his place? Binyamin was the only one of the brothers who was not involved in any which way of the sale of Yosef. All of the brothers were involved, even Reuven, who didn't really want to sell Joseph. He said, let's throw him in the pit and let's come back for him later. He came back and he wasn't there. He still was held accountable for what happened. Now you might ask Yosef, maybe the whole portion should have been in Yosef. The whole temple should have been Yosef. Again, when something happens to someone, it's normally because they bring it upon themselves, believe it or not. Joseph did act in a way and he was punished because of that. He did act in a way which brought upon himself the jealousy and the very own selling of himself by his brothers. The Zeref Shishon back in Parashat, if it was Vayeshev or something around then, did really speak to us about that concept. If you go back on the YouTube channel and you find it over there, we spoke specifically about Joseph bringing on through the three things that he spoke negatively about his brothers to. Nevertheless, Binyamin himself was the only of the tribes to not be involved in anything to do with the sale of Joseph and the eventual exile to Egypt. And because of that, the temple is in his plot. How can the descendants or the division of the land that the temple's in come out and cry out to God for mercy, have mercy on the Jewish people, when they themselves or their ancestor, the tribes themselves, had no mercy on their very own brother Yosef. So specifically the temple was in Binyamin, who only displayed mercy. He did not have that opportunity. He never didn't display mercy <coughs> towards anyone. So that's why it was in his place. <coughs> Furthermore, if you take the word Yashpeh, Yashpeh, which is the name of the stone, it could also be read as Yesh Peh, the Zer Shimshon says. There is a mouth, meaning, as we say in Hebrew, Yesh Dibu. There is a conversation. There is room for a dialogue. Again, from Binyamin to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in realms of speech, in realms of prayer, had a very powerful connection. Again, because he never was involved in the selling of his brother. And Binyamin specifically, and since the temple was in this plot of Binyamin, again, the prayers delivered there had a very strong way of being answered because it was only mercy involved and there was no ruthlessness or bearing any hatred from tribe to, to tribe. So that's Binyamin. So going back, the walls, according to that opinion, should have been made out of Yashveh, why? Because it served as a protection from illness and danger, right? That's what the sigula of it is. And also, it served as promotion for prayers being answered. Because it's in the plot of Binyamin. So use the same stone of Binyamin. Comes God and says, you know what? 
I like both of what you're saying. I like the Shoham stone and the reasons we said for that. And I like the Yeshve stone and the reasons said for that. Let's make a combination. Let's use both. Hashem settles it and says, let's use the stones which represent the two children of Rachel and make a combination between those stones in the exterior fortifying wall of the Beit HaMikdash. Now, why the children of Rachel? What did she do to merit that not only is the temple in the plot of her children, but that the fortifying walls should be only out of the stones which are represented by her children? What did she do that is so important? So if we look at something that she did and constantly does as the Nevi'im explain us, is as follows. If we look at in Irmiyahu, chapter 31, verse 14, it says, al the, the Prophet is telling us that Rachel forevermore is crying for her children. She is always praying for her children. She will never be consoled until her children are redeemed once and for all. As a mother, seeing that her children are not at their final destination, at their final realm of success, she was never and could never be consoled. That's why she was the one to have the merit that her children should have the temple built in her portion and her children's stones attributed to her should be the fortifying, the guard, the protection, the blessing for the, the Jewish people, specifically Rachel. If we look in Yeshayahu chapter 54, verse 11, it says, Aniya so'ara lo nuhama, afflicted one, lashes by storms and not com uh, comforted. That the Jewish people are never going to be comforted until we finally have that final redemption of the Mashiach. And the next verse is the verse we brought, the verse we started off in the Talmud, that God will make your battlements and your boundaries of fine stones, the clear connection between Rachel and the Jewish people. But there's one more thing we have to address. And that is if we look at that verse and it says, Vesamti kadkod kadchod shim totaich, shim shotaich, which means that the frames and the walls will be made and fortified very strong. But shim shotaich, which is the word referring to the stones of the wall, we've never seen that word before. Shim shotaich sounds like shemesh, sounds like a sun. Why is the verse, the Zer Shimshon say, referring to the wall as a sun? What does a sun do, especially in its strength? It shines, it illuminates. The Talmud tells us that the Bet HaMikdash, the temple itself, illuminated the world. It was a light upon the world, not only for the Jews, but for the nations themselves. If you would look at the fortifying wall of the temple back in the day, in its <coughs> splendor, it was shiny. It was glittering. It shone like the, like the sun in its strength, obviously, to show that the Jewish people were to, through the Beit HaMikdash, shine upon the whole world. Now finally, after keeping you waiting so long, Rabbi, what are those stones? I need those stones. So we let, where can we get them? Where to get them, I'm sure you could find. Right but one. what's the stone? The right one is good. So, a Shoham stone is an onyx, a black onyx stone, okay? Now, it's very special, maybe you want to make a piece of jewelry with it. Black Shoham stone is a black onyx, okay? A Yashve is a jasper stone. A jasper stone, very different in color than a Shoham, is multi colored, all different types of colors. If you look at the breastplate, the replica pictures of it, you look at the bottom two ones, you look at Yosef's stone, is black. You look at Binyamin's stone, it's multi-colored. Alluding to the Shoham onyx stone and alluding to the Jasper Yashve stone. 
and remember exactly the merits that we spoke about then. So when you would look at, to bring it back into how shiny it was, if you'd look at the fortifying wall of the Bet HaMikdash, it would be a beautiful combination of black stones with this colorful, beautiful rainbow stone mixed into it, almost in like a mosaic, a beautiful mosaic, that would be the fortifying wall of the temple that should be rebuilt, amen. So what lesson can we take for us from this, I think, extraordinary piece from the Zerah Shimshon? Is that back in the time of the temple, the temple and the service in the temple and God's very own presence in the temple was what was illuminating the world. Unfortunately, now we don't have the temple. We're working towards bringing it back. Hachamim tell us we are to be a light upon the nations. We need to bring light to this world. How do we bring light into this world? By doing what's right, by acting with loving kindness, by helping others, by giving to others, by fulfilling the will of God, by learning and spreading His Torah, learning what God's Word is and what He wants from us. That's what we are to be. We need to be, until the building of the Beit HaMikdash, we need to make ourselves a miniature Beit HaMikdash. We need to create ourselves that fortifying wall made out of Shoam stones and Yashfeh stones and shine and illuminate the whole world. Us Jews, as the chosen people, have that ability to bring light into this world and shine upon the nations. We have that power. Take the Torah, take the mitzvot, take our kindness, take it and let it spread along the whole world and illuminate the whole world through God's wisdom, divinity, His infinite self, His omnipresence. And let us be blessed by doing so from the very holy words of the Zerah Shimshon. Amen.